All right. Uh, so I'm really excited about this. Uh, EdgeConf is kind of like the focal point of a discussion around uh, using cutting edge technologies to build amazing user experiences. But I think kind of the elephant in the room is it's great to learn all about all these new technologies, but what about older browsers, browsers that are less capable that cannot take advantage of some of these things? So this session is an opportunity to kind of discuss uh, some of those challenges that we've had for a long time and what we can do about them now. Uh, we have a really powerful uh, panel up here, so let me quickly introduce everyone. Uh, over here to my right is Shwetong Dixit. Uh, he has been on the uh, Opera Developer Relations team and Open Web team for a while now, uh, working a lot on compatibility of all sorts of sites. Um, so whether they have willy-nilly regexes that are blocking uh, Opera and such. Um, also a member of the um, Web Education Community Group and the Mobile Web for Social Development uh, Group at the, at the W3C. To my left, uh, Tomomi Amura. So she has been um, kind of fighting for the mobile web for a long time, ever since 2005 when she was uh, leading the mobile uh, yahoo.com. Uh, yahoo.com? m.yahoo.com, yes. Um, uh, also was using uh, Werfel to great success, uh, trying to wrangle all sorts of uh, kind of tricky little mobile devices coming over there. Um, worked at WebOS and is now at Nokia. Cool. Um, on her left is Ed Souden. Ed uh, works for the uh, government digital service. And uh, the GDS finished a just big, huge redesign of gov.uk, a kind of much lauded uh, progressive enhancement redesign, bringing all of the UK's government online. And they're now continuing to bring more departments online. Um, they've done a, a really good job kind of presenting the best way to do progressive enhancement and documenting kind of their strategies and methodologies and also providing a very like transparent development process, blogging, documenting, guidelines everywhere. Really fantastic job. And our opening speaker, uh, Tom Maslin. Tom is the tech lead for uh, BBC News Visual Journalism. Um, and has been leading the client-side team for uh, the mobile BBC News team for a while. Uh, has been kind of a standards-based developer, knows browser uh, performance and JavaScript extremely well. Uh, and also, a while ago, worked on the team that built and open-sourced the Glode JavaScript library. So small part of that. Last from the past. All right, cool. So Tom, if you want to take it away, sure. it'd be great. Hi. Hello. And uh, can I have my slides? Hi, hello, and welcome to the introduction talk, uh, <laughs> Legacy Clients by me, Tom Maslin, or as I think this talk should really be called, yay, I'm so excited. There's going to be five versions of Internet Explorer for me to support next year. I'm 34 years old. Back in my arrogant 20s, I saw myself as a bit of a hand solo, flying around the office, saving princesses' websites, fixing bugs, my job used to be easy. I had four rendering engines to support, and yeah, I also had to worry about accessibility, but writing my code semantically fixed that. And I also had to concern myself about SEO, but that's essentially accessibility for search engines, right? So my semantic code sorted that too. This was a time when we could all afford to be little hand solos, Built, quickly put in sites together. But then in 2007, all that changed when Steve Jobs invented the bloody iPhone. <laughs> Shit got more complicated. <laughs> Suddenly, we had mobiles with very slow connection speeds, and phones with different size screens, uh, new types of interactions. Smartphones started to, per to appear with pathetic little processors and tiny amounts of RAM that ran my code really slowly. And PPK also pointed out that there was like 100 different versions of WebKits to support. But all of these problems were nothing compared to what was about to wash over us, an avalanche of devices. Being confident little hand solos wasn't good enough anymore. Instead, we've all had to become uh, uh, intelligent, clever spots who can balance all of these issues against getting our job done correctly. As developers, this is the biggest problem that we have today, balancing agility, getting the stuff uh, done quickly, versus robustness, getting the stuff done right. Now, 
in this paradigm that we find ourselves in, it's very easy to concentrate on this issue so much that we forget about boring old issues like supporting IE7 and 8. I can test in IE8 and 7 using a virtual machine on my Mac, but it's really hard to, oh, sorry. <laughs> but it's really hard to do. Uh, the experience is slow, and the dev tools are terrible. Trying to get uh, IE7 dev tools to do I want is like asking a Wookiee that's wearing boxing gloves to wipe my bottom clean. <laughs> it's a terrible situation <laughs> that normally ends up covering you in something. <laughs> uh, it's some bugs I, j I just give up on because it's not worth spending the time required to fix it to fix such a small uh, fix a problem with, for such a small audience. It raises questions about whether we should actually support these browsers. I'd argue that sometimes it depends. While the challenges surrounding client support have increased, web development itself has become more popular. It's entered the mainstream. Everyone from school children to contestants on uh, The Apprentice are now making web pages. And the act of making a web page is actually pretty easy. Build something, look at it in your browser, there you go, it's done, it's very fast. But as I've just shown you, the practice of web development is the complete opposite. It's actually really, uh, it's actually really hard to do right. Anyone can pick up a book or read an article online and, uh, that teaches you how to make a web page how to write HTML5 or CSS or JavaScript. These things are hard to master, but they're easy to start doing. What is hard to learn, though, is how to scale your website up from a single user, i.e. yourself, to a larger audience. These things here, they help you to scale your audience, but learning them is much harder, because to understand these, uh, these you have to change the context of your thinking away from what's in front of you. As a developer, I often find myself having to defend these things. But ultimately, the web isn't about these. They're important, but we don't do accessibility for the sake of accessibility. And we don't make sites fast or SEO friendly or work without JavaScript because it's nice. What we're trying to achieve, our actual end goal, is ubiquity. We want as many people as possible to see our site. The web should be inclusive not exclusive. I mean, nobody would build a shop that only the dwarf for, uh, from Game of Thrones could get into, right? Shops have doors that are wide and as tall as possible. Websites should be the same. An easier way to think of ubiquity is to call it browser support. When people talk about web browser support, they think, well, how far back should we go? IE6, IE7. In the, web app, uh, in the website versus native apps debate, the reason why website wins is because apps are binary. They either work or they don't. An iOS app works on an iPhone, but it doesn't work on an Android. However, your site will work on both. And even, be and even better, if you build it properly, it will work to a certain degree on pretty much anything. It's the ubiquity of the web that wins. So to go back to the original problem I defined, this job is also harder because the problem is continuing to increase in complexity. And we have to balance that against getting stuff, uh, getting stuff done fast and robustly. What we shouldn't do is fight that complexity with ever more complex solutions. People who build responsive websites that are really just a collection of smaller websites within it are creating more problems for themselves. When a problem grows to a certain size, the problem changes into something else. And to survive, you have to change how you think as well. We did that at BBC News. We turned the problem of browser support upside down. Instead of thinking about how far back we should go, we decided to uh, support everything. We call this uh, technique cutting the mustard. The responsive site has a very basic core experience that has uh, a simple layout is very fast, and is delivered to all browsers. The core experience is good enough to allow any, everyone to consume the news. On top of this, we built an enhanced experience using JavaScript and modern CSS. Pardon me. It has a complex layout and is very functional. This is only delivered to modern browsers. It's conditionally loaded by checking for the existence of specific features. 
All the browsers that cut the mustard have great JavaScript and CSS support. They have fast rendering engines and are less buggy. This technique is robust because it supports a massive amount of browsers. It's also agile, as you're building the, the enhanced experience using code, uh, modern coding practices. But IE 7 and 8 only get the core experience. Now, this might be good enough for you if these browsers don't bring a significant amount of traffic. Or you might decide that these browsers need more than just the core experience. How do you do that? Well, with two ways. We can edit the cuts of the mustard test to load an alternative JavaScript, uh, the app that uh, specifically just for IE 7 and 8. We can then cherry pick what features of the enhanced experience we give them, like uh, a two column layout or video support. We also need to give these browsers better CSS. With mobile first CSS, IE 7 and 8 only render the smallest view because they don't understand media queries. But with a CSS preprocessor, you can output a version of a site style at any defined width, specifically for these browsers. Uh, the panelist Ed Salden has already implemented this uh, for the UK government website. And here's one example of how you can do it. Instead of writing media queries directly into your SAS, uh, use uh, this mix in instead. Then make a new SAS file that sets a variable with the width value that you want uh, IE 7 and 8 to render the desktop view to. Import the main SAS file into this, and it will render out an alternative desktop-only version of your CSS into a new file. You should, you should add the legacy IE style sheet into the page using a conditional comment. Now, however, uh, you have to be careful now, as IE 7 and 8 will be exposed to your modern CSS, and there's lots of selectors and properties that you need to watch out for. If you're unlucky, you may find IE 7 and 8 will be rendering your modern CSS onto the page in a way that reminds you of how Donald Trump's hair renders itself onto his head. <laughs> so uh, to summarize, how do you support legacy clients? I'd say don't think about stretching your code across an ever-increasing uh, browser support list. The problem is only ever going to get more complex. And you can't keep up by making an ever more complex solution. If you keep thinking like a hand solo, eventually, this problem will get on top of you. Instead, I think the best way to solve this is with teamwork. Use a solid base of progressive enhancement as a springboard for your JavaScript. And treat each feature on your website like an away mission, deciding when to send these aging browsers to the fore. So that's enough for me. Uh, let's chat about it. <laughs> Very nice. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Gee, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. That was great. Uh, so we'll go to our first question. Uh, our first question uh, delivered by Hakim. There. Hello. Yeah. Anonymous question. Why should there be a stigma attached to not supporting older clients? If a developer knows their audience and they all have the latest clients, what's the problem? I think that should be. Why is there a stigma attached, and not what? Why should there be? Uh, so I'll rephrase it. So, uh, Shwetang, do you want to take this? Why? Why should there be? Why is there a stigma attached to not supporting all the browsers? Um, there is, but there shouldn't be. Um, mainly because um, when it comes to older browsers, there's a lot of there's a lot of reason to actually support older browsers because. There's a lot of times in which the user cannot update their browser, um, whether it's because uh, the system administrator doesn't allow it, or because many times the the user doesn't know what a browser is. So if you say, you know, update your browser, it's like, you know, how could I update my browser? I don't know what it what it is. So um, that's one thing. Uh, second things are that uh, sometimes people know what a browser is; they're fully aware of how to update it, but they don't want to. Um, maybe it, it, sometimes it's because they're on a, f you know, they're using a phone and they have a very crappy network, and they might use a proxy browser instead of, you know, something which is like a full-fledged browser. Um, 
and proxy browsers are tricky, as we'll see um, later on. Um, sometimes people have very limited uh, data plans. Uh, I know people in Europe who have 30 MB data plans for a month, and if you exceed that, then you'll get charged very, very highly. Um, so there's multiple reasons why, and genuine reasons why, um, you should support um, older or proxy browsers, and uh, there shouldn't be any stigma attached uh, as such. I mean, we all like to play with the greatest and you know the most cutting edge stuff, but you know the realities of the world is we we need to deal with everyone, and uh, sometimes it's a, you know there's also um, um, what you call uh, regulation or some laws regarding accessibility and. Um, stuff like that as well, which which need to be uh, considered as, as well. So um, yeah. So I wonder um, if so. The second part is is if we do like know what your clients are. If you're looking at analytics and numbers, and they're indicating that you're okay on dropping support for IE six and seven and potentially eight, um, is that fine? I, th I think it depends on the context of the content. I think uh, if you're uh, making a, a government website, then uh, that, there definitely is a stigma because uh, these services uh, are like mandatory. They, they have to be uh, viewable by anyone. But if you're making an application like Gmail, then probably not because somebody with IE7 won't give you that much uh, benefit. Ed, uh, is, there, is there legal like legislation that requires the accessibility to old browsers? So there's, there's the only legal legislation or legal things that exist for older browsers are accessibility. Um, you can be sued for not having an accessible website, but like that's up for the user to determine what accessible is. Like the, the stigma that we have, this industry seems to have this horrible stigma with that, oh, you can't drop support for old browsers, you can't drop support for, like, you've got to go back to the question, what is supporting an old browser? Like. Supporting an old browser for most of us means that we're going to test in it. Like, so that's not support at all. That means you're testing in these browsers. Supporting is like, actually, if anyone has a problem, you're going to fix it for them. Like, that's support. Like, yeah. So if someone has a problem using your website, yeah, you want to help that person out. But like, there shouldn't be any stigma attached with helping someone. Because <laughs> but like, if you want to spend time making sure ahead of time that those people won't have problems, then that's how you spend your time. I see. You know, but the one problem I seen is that, okay, let's say maybe you know by the statistics, you know, the each company is the service of stat, and maybe they just decide to drop the IE support. And sometimes they are doing it in the wrong way. I mean, they try to, you know, like a sniff in the user agent or something, and try to eliminate all the IE which seem to be old, but many times they're like doing it the wrong way. So let's say, you know, I work for Nokia and I use the Lumia phone regularly, right? And uh, my browser choice, well, it's not my choice, actually. It comes with an uh, no, operating system, and it's IE10. And oftentimes, I see the site like, oops, sorry, you know, you have to update your browser. It's like, really? It's IE10 is pretty decent, and I believe that, you know, a service or sites should work. But I think they just, you know, try to sniff it out mistakenly and uh, you know, try to suggest me to upgrade the browser or just download some other browsers. But the thing is, like you were saying, we don't always have a choice. You know, users don't, don't always have the choice. So that's something I have to just remind, you know, people have to remind. So I guess on the topic of support, um, <clears throat> support is kind of a, it's a difficult, it is the verb that we always use in this discussion. <laughs> And it implies that it is a binary decision. You either support it or you don't. And I think for many of our development cycles, our development approach, support is kind of this sliding scale. Um, and so, so Tom, with cutting the mustard, when a browser falls into unsupported, they get a core experience. There is, right? So there is, no, there is no unsupported. The, the idea is that everybody is supplied a core experience everybody gets the content but the content the way it's displayed is very simple mm. so uh, if there's additional content on the home page of the BBC news site for example uh, like analysis and features that's available but you have to click it to go to it so the experience is very basic very but, simple. Uh, so, but so. you still get all the content. But then with the premium version, right. we'll just go and fetch all of that content and put it straight into the page for you. And is the difference in your case the 
amount of uh, testing between core and the premium experience? I imagine you you are not as actively testing uh, the core experience. No, the core experience is so simple. It's a single column. Uh, we, we don't add any functionality into the page. Yeah, so that's going to pretty much render on anything. Right. Mm. I think uh, um, Andy Clark, a uh, uh, well-known developer in the UK, uh, a while ago released a universal IE6 style sheet. The idea here was basically a style sheet that had very good-looking typography, um, but you know, destroyed all the layout, killed all your floats, just kept it all in a single column. And the idea was give that to IE, give them nothing else. The content is there and it's accessible, um, but you can forget about and like the visualness of the rest of the site. Uh, and I think that's kind of a nice way for something to go unsupported, is basically to fall into a pit of accessible content. So that the like having a, an IE6 style sheet which has virtually nothing is kind of the approach we took for one of the large sections of GovUK. Because um, we used the approach that Tom was mentioning during the uh, intro with the, uh, using mobile first and then sending specific IE sheet, uh, style sheets for IE6, 7, and 8. But IE6, they don't get any layout because layout's added on desktop. Um, so IE6 just gets a mobile view. So it has no, it's a single column. It's basically got typography because I, that's all that it gets. I think it's a benefit as well because people with IE6 or i 7 probably don't have a good computer. And so the fact that it's so simple means it will render like five or six times faster than, right, than other it's experiences. It's readable. And as long as users mm. can get what they want, you know, mm. experience is not killed. I think that's a, that's a good strategy because um, there's so many sites which either support it or just send an error message saying that, okay, this site is not supported and that's it. The user cannot do anything about that. Um, so I think that's um, a very important thing, that you don't block anyone. You at least serve them the core experience. Um, the first part of that question was if you know your audience. And it's really difficult to know you, your audience in a very, very accurate way. Uh, even if you know using your statistics and your analysis, um, you know what are the browsers which are coming through. You know there are times in which you get you know a mention on the front page of Reddit, or you you get slashed on it, or an, in, an influential uh, news website mentions you, and then you'll get this whole stream of traffic which is completely unpredictable. So you know even that premise of that question that you know your audience is flawed. So I think it's a good time to move on to the next question. Uh, this one uh, to be asked by John Fellows. So this is an anonymous question. Uh, what's the best way to make legacy clients a visible part of the development process? So I think this is uh, both uh, visibility on the developer side to understand um, uh, what is necessary to, to give them what you plan to give them, um, and also potentially on kind of the executive side to better understand what, from a development cost perspective, um, is included here. I uh, so it, at the BBC News uh, once we uh, we made the responsive site, but it was a small team that did it, and then eventually we fanned it out to the rest of the department, and so we've had to go through a a, a training process with everyone as they as they become engaged with the product. but uh, So we've got the, uh, the designers thinking about the core experience as well, and they're thinking about progressive enhancements. So they start off with uh, the core experience, and then they progressively enhance it and make the better version. The, the problem that we find is that uh, many people just associate the core basic experience with a very thin uh, layout. What they find harder to do is, is to probably try and understand that the core experience could be any width, and the premium experience could be any width as well. Hmm. I also wonder, is there um, uh, included on this, I think there is a visibility of, of kind of the perceived experience um, between legacy clients and modern clients. And, and one of these parts is performance, certainly. So uh, just rendering a page or any sort of ac interactivity with a more modern browser, uh, it's going to be quite a bit more responsive. Um, is there a good way to kind of uh, demonstrate the difference between uh, the user experience of someone on an older client versus a newer client? And is that something that, you know, that the executive team wants to see and understand? 
Hmm, maybe I would say, I'd say some UI or I would say UX using some ajax -y type of interaction and that works probably wonderfully on, you know, latest greatest browsers, I mean, Chrome, and Chrome and desktop, would, you know, work nicely. But yeah, they show the same UI on, let's say, like older mobile browsers or it could be Android, all the Android and stuff. It's probably, it's going to look really janky or maybe even it fails, you know, so. A lot of it's managing expectation, though. Like, people on old browsers, people on IE6, uh, who are stuck on IE6 in their corporate environments, they'll be used to an internet which is not quite like the internet the rest mm. of us use. Um, <laughs> so while, like, for me or for you, browsing a website in IE6 will feel painfully janky and painfully horrible, like, it's, they're kind of almost expecting that. Um, and people aren't left on these browsers because they want to be there. Like, they're there because those are the browsers they have, because corporate IT have said that's what they've got. Like, so it's all a case of managing expectation for those guys. Those, those people, if they, if they know they're getting a janky experience, like, they come into that knowing. And my colleagues, I have colleagues who, work, who have IE6 as their browser on their machines, and they know it's going to look crap. And they just like, they, they joke with me, like, is this supposed to look that bad? And it was like, yeah, I, I think the developer picked that color for you. It's like, no. <laughs> they know the internet's horrible. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, um, just to add or maybe even remove from your point, um, they might be used to it um, on when, when they're working, but for sure they're using the internet when at their home or on their mobile or in transit or something. So they know what the internet, what the real internet is like and it'll be even more frustrating for them to 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 see the internet as it is you know in in the wild on IE6 all the time at work go and sit next to them at work they their the lives are a pain at work anyway they know <laughs> uh calvin spielman something then yeah um, actually i was going to ask exactly what you just said but i the i wanted to ask specifically is there a way to if People have these different experiences at work and at home. They know your site's different when they're actually at work, and something might be missing functionality they're used to at home. Is there some strategy we can take to, um, to make them not frustrated at us, seeming like they're suddenly hitting a broken version of the site that they were used to? Well, I think this comes back to the like the approach with cutting the mustard. You make sure they can get the content they need to get still. Like, while it will look different, it will feel a bit different. As long as they can achieve the goals that they need to achieve. Like, it's the best you can do for them. Like, true. I guess I think you know what I'm hearing from from both of you is that there is kind of uh, both strategies include a, a degraded experience for uh, older browsers um, in some way, uh, and that seems to scale pretty well. Uh, but that does mean that we do have at least two experiences, um, and so if we are in a situation where you have someone that has seen both of those experiences, is that going to be a problem? I, uh, I, I, I think that's fine because uh, we can't, like I said in the talk, we can't make uh, a, a, a premium experience that works across the whole uh, spectrum of browsers because uh, polyfilling and uh, mobile internet connections are, are so hard to marry up together. Yeah, so it's going it, it to, it has to be good enough because yeah. there's no other way. No. Yeah, it's better than just showing them that oh, you know, your your browser is not supported by. You know, it's at least better than that. I guess, I guess. Sorry, the one caveat to what I just said is that if you uh, do server side detection and sniff for old browsers, which is probably because normally people when they talk about uh, UA sniffing, you think about oh, is this a mobile device right. or is this a desktop device? Whereas I think now we should probably be thinking about is is this an old browser or a new or a new browser? I think that'd be an in, interesting. In your case, would it be is this a it, does this browser browser cut the mustard? Versus yeah, you could do that on, on the server if you wanted to. Right, like you know the old browser that doesn't support JavaScript or doesn't understand you know JavaScript uh, feature detection, then you have to rely on the server side. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, all right, I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, this one comes from uh, Dustin Kasten. Dustin's up here in the purple. 
Hey, so uh, what as a community can we do to help the uh, holdouts of legacy clients, such as the government and IT departments? To nothing. <laughs> that, was, that was my answer as well. I was going to say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did a little bit of research uh, on uh, kind of around this point before I came. Um, the thing Paul said to me earlier, um, I've built a thing so which like takes your Google Analytics and splits out browsers uh, with graphs. You can see browser usage over time. So it's called, it's called Browser Matrix. Takes in your Google Analytics account and then just charts the trend lines for a browser. Paul said it'd be really cool if it could show future like trends. Trend lines. So I went and had a look, um, <laughs> because I'm a nerd, uh, at IE6s and 7s trend lines on GovUK. Um, they're going down. IE6 lost half a percent in the last six months. What um, percent was it? It's gone from just over one to around half. Uh, just is, that, half. is that any particular time of the week? So, uh, if you, we, it can also show you stats uh, on a day by day, seven day rolling basis. Um, and during the week, uh, six is above that. And at weekends, it's not really there. But I guess the question is like, but in the case, like I eight would be a better case. So, like those guys, they're going down. They're going to get there. Um, and. From the government perspective, like working in government, um, everyone is painfully aware in government that we're tied into these horrible contracts that require us to have IE6, and everyone's working to try and get out of them. Like no one is trying to stay in that world. There's not much a development community can do uh, to help that. Like, and like, on GovUK, we have a browser bar that pops up if you're on an old browser um, that says "Try and upgrade." Which hilariously, when we won it, we did won a design award earlier this year, and uh, a whole collection of the screenshots that were in news articles, you could see that browser bar. So, <laughs> 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 made us smile, uh, smile that these people writing reports for fairly large um, magazines online still use old browsers as well. But in terms of government and massive corporates, very aware we're trying to get rid of it internally. Uh, question from the audience, uh, Daniel. So we we always want to <coughs> all our users to be happy, and I looked at some numbers, and we have IE all of IE is like eight percent of our traffic, maybe four percent of our traffic. Uh, IE, <laughs> IE. but uh, is it worth? Spending the effort versus things like developer happiness and retention. It sounds like it's not worth the effort for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sounds like you're doing well. I'd, I'd say uh, it depends. I mean, those uh, old devices might bring uh, a lot of traffic to your site, but do they bring uh, a lot of revenue? And right, I think that's something that that uh, it's. I don't know that we've seen a lot um, in the way of, of business metrics that are segregated by browser or by connectivity um, or by the performance, the load time of the site. Uh, but I think it's, it's worth looking into kind of how those uh, technical metrics of, of the site and of those users translate into their, their success on the site. Um, I guess to get back to, to Dustin's question, um, we're talking about what our community can do to help legacy clients. Um, so Google, um, Google Apps dropped support for IE8 uh, last November. Um, and Google Analytics dashboard is dropping support for IE8 in, in a few months. Uh, Google has a policy of, of only supporting the, the most recent and the last version. Um, and so Google's being kind of aggressive in this and saying you just have to upgrade in order to use it. You can't use uh, Google Docs on IE8. Uh, but is there anyone else that is in a position where they can help move this forward? Or were you just in a case where we are just waiting for those trend lines to naturally go down over the course of years, as we did with IE6? Internally in UK government, I'd love to say more, but uh, <laughs> there is work going on to fix it there. But yeah, it's still like there are people trying. One more thing that I I wanted to add was um, a lot of these things are decided at the contract level. Um, sometimes what happens is um, I can at least talk about the Indian government. Sometimes what happens is uh, they don't make the government websites. They sometimes send it out to a you know a contractor who who makes it for them, um, and usually. 
things are decided at you know when the contract is signed and, and if you don't if, if there's a clause saying that okay i6 will be supported you know it has to be supported um, so one of the th things is to you know as a web developer if you're vying for that contract to argue at that level before signing that yes you know i will not be supporting these things i might be supporting the the newer versions um, and and the second thing i wanted to mention was this problem is um, exacerbated by the fact that many people who were in government didn't weren't really tech savvy that much um, for a while. They didn't really know about browsers and you know stuff like that. But with uh, newer devices coming in, you know people are having iPhones and iPads and stuff like that. They're, they they still might not know what a browser is or not care, but they they know that okay whatever I'm you know this website that I'm um, sending the contract for it has to work on my iPad for example. So you know they're more focused on on those things on devices rather than the older browsers. Uh, so that mind shift is happening a little bit. But um, once again, as 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 web developers, before signing the contract, you have to see it and be very careful uh, about that. Talking of contracts, is uh, all contracts that UK government signs now cannot have anything which uh, even hints at vendor lock-in or device or browser lock-in. Anything that hints at a specific version is has to be removed before contracts can go out to tender. There's nothing like that that's allowed anymore. Hmm. Uh, a comment from the audience, Mary from O'Reilly. Hey, so just going back to, we were talking earlier about how frustrating it is for your coworkers if they have one browser version at home and one browser version at work and those types of scenarios. I think we might be referring to a very specific portion of the world in that those are the people who are very tech savvy, who have the latest and greatest things, who, yeah, you know, bigger and newer is better. But what about the rest of the world that you know, updating your browser is scary because it means all of a sudden you don't know how to use it anymore. So there's people who consciously make the choice to not update because of that. So yeah, your moms. Are, I'm sorry. Yeah, your moms. Well, okay. So yeah, that's an example. My mom does that, and it. But I mean, it's a it's a legit scenario. Sure. And so by by eliminating that. Um, the ability for them to view your website, you're basically telling them they don't matter. Yes, I, th I think change of version is real for everyone in, in a lot of cases, browsers and website features as well. Uh, I mean, my, t my take here is that it's a lot of it is up to browser makers themselves to make transitions uh, as smooth as possible. That's we're good now because the problem was always IE, right? And <laughs> like, or, or more like corporate corporate IE. So people would build corporate intranets and they would rely on ActiveX, and that's why we're in a situation where there's so many uh, corporate desktops that, that can't upgrade. Yeah, I was going to mention about that too. Many times you, know, you can't just download, install any browsers and any computers. You have to ask IT guys to do that. You know, So they obviously, you know, probably that's where you know, a lot of legacy IE is coming from. So you know, if you're you know, working for the web services for uh, like enterprise and such, this is something like a really huge issue and you have to really watch out uh, your know, browser stats and what your, you know, the people are using. So uh, I want to move on to the next question, but before I do, I want to get uh, Jeffrey Bertoff from Microsoft. Uh, since we are talking about IE a lot, uh, it'd be <laughs> nice to get uh, his comment here. Yeah, thank you. So. First, to defend Microsoft here, one thing I want to make sure, <laughs> and I do that proudly, because one of the things I want to make sure that we understand is that um, Windows XP that runs IE8 was a great product, and that's why people still use it. So anytime we build great products, we're going to have to deal with legacy browsers, because they're going to stick around. So if you look at a parallel to iOS, so we just stopped, or Apple just stopped supporting was it 3GS with updates, which means that iOS 6 is the last version they'll ever see. But those phones are going to continue to be around, and they'll become a legacy platform that we have to support. So when we have good products that are going to stick around, it's something that we need to plan for. So these type of discussions will always be relevant. Well, I think in this in this case, we're in, uh, our situation is that uh, I, uh, Windows XP is a great product. Uh, but the problem there is that uh, users of IE on Windows XP don't have an ability to upgrade their browser to the next version of IE. Yeah, so that's, 
you know, that's something that's, that's clear. If you are on that platform, there's two different things that are going to cause you to stay on older versions of IE. One is it's your environment, whether it's because you don't want to upgrade or you can't upgrade, or uh, the fact that with IE, you can't upgrade past IE 8 if right. you're on Windows XP. So our, 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 at Microsoft, we use JavaScript. We use our JavaScript engine, HTML5, in a lot of our products. And so whether it's writing apps for Office or in Embedded or in Xbox or in Windows 8 apps, all of that can be done with the JavaScript engine. So there's definitely a coupling there that makes us have to draw some lines in the sands as to where we can, can update and where we can't. So um, it's not that it's, there's reasons behind it, I guess is what I would say. Sure, so, and I guess we can close this IE discussion uh, for now uh, with the um, end of support date for Windows XP is April 2014. That's right. Uh, so that trend line that we're watching for IE8 will may potentially um, drop down more more substantially at that point. So there's like there's a whole other like dark world which no one talks about. Um, talking about like old IEs and the fact there are other things which we have to support which no one talks about, uh, and they're old screen readers. Um, Actually, screen reading uh, technology. Ed, before we move on to, to screen readers, I want to get Alex Russell's uh, comments here. Hi, thanks. Uh, Alex Russell, one of my first projects at Google was a product called Chrome Frame, um, which was necessitated because you didn't do what you just said. Microsoft didn't take care of the legacy, right? It was Microsoft's responsibility to do that, and instead, Microsoft chose not to invest in making sure that users of Windows XP could continue to use modern technology. So. Um, Having done the cleanup work for you, I just need to uh, <laughs> make the point that you didn't. <laughs> uh, this is going to get exciting. So <laughs> for the moment, uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, this one, uh, uh, Matthias Kuzman, Kautzman. Hi, my question is, for how long is it worth polyfilling features for legacy browsers and taking the hit in performance or dev productivity? What factors should influence the ultimate choice to see support for a legacy client? So yeah, so in a lot of cases, uh, our method of dealing with older clients that don't support a certain capability is polyfilling them. Um, we started out with uh, the JSON 2.js, JSON polyfill, um, and we've managed to polyfill many, many things. Uh, these polyfills do have performance costs, not only in, in the bytes that we have to send on the wire um, in CSS and JavaScript, but also in runtime performance. Uh, so performance of polyfills is a concern. Uh, and what are the other aspects that um, could help influence the choice to see support might not be the right words, but um, change the support level? So maybe a good example is with animations. So a couple of years ago, people would do JavaScript animations. And now uh, we try to do all animations with CSS. And we just say, well, if you don't have that uh, CSS feature, you just get uh, a janky animation. I, I'd, I'd say that's fine. I don't have a problem with people in IE uh, getting janky uh, transitions. Right, I'm not sure about jankiness. <laughs> I mean, if you. Yeah, if you want to have some animation, but you know, have, doesn't work in some browsers, I think you have to just kill the animation. It, I think not moving at all, it's far better than janky animation. So when I say janky, I literally yeah. mean like binary, like it's it's closed, then it's open. Okay. But then it, with yeah, with a more modern browser, right, right, you can right. like slide something out. Off, like, yeah. Totally. Yeah, Although I guess an issue with that is not so much with polyfill. Uh, something I've seen recently where I made uh, like a panel appear, and I made I gave it a nice animation. Uh, grow. Uh, it worked lovely in iOS, but when I checked it on an Android, uh, an Amazon Kindle Fire, that you know, it had a great browser. It supported the feature, but it was really, it was really janky, because because the hardware just just couldn't just couldn't keep up. Right. And not just the hardware. Actually, the Amazon Kindle, you know, the sealed browser is a proxy browser. Hmm. You know, well, maybe a marketing term is like cloud accelerated browser or whatever that is, you know? So, 
Yeah, so that has to keep in mind. It's not like all JavaScript is supposed to work in some WebKit. You know, works in as way you want in a proxy. But I think, um, I guess, when we talk about legacy clients, there's a few reasons why. Like, we use the term legacy, uh, and that does happen to usually <laughs> refer to them being old. But I think the reason that we don't embrace them and love them is because uh, they, they may have bugs. They're probably slower than what we're used to. And they lack features that we want to use, that we're interested in using. Um, so it's not necessarily that they're old, but they aren't good as what we want. Um, and I mean, is it worth forming a policy around how to change your support level for browsers? What do you, what's your take on this, Shutank? Um, I think ultimately there's there's going to be so many variations that you should stop uh, with the mindset of supporting or not supporting a, a, you know those kind of browsers or not you know you, you should just go with the with the thing of progressive enhancement and you know uh, feature detection and because what will happen is you know you you say that okay I'll gonna I'm going to support this old browser but ultimately what what will happen is you'll you'll get more and more devices but nowadays we we'll, we get devices uh, which are running a very good version of Android, um, but are you know less than hundred dollars. So even though they're they're running like a very very nice version of WebKit, for example, uh, the performance is such that it really makes them almost like a legacy browser uh, in some, many cases. So the how do you define a legacy browser is 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 going to become more and more muddled because a browser with a very very nice phone um, can be, be uh, behave like a legacy browser if the network connection sucks. Um, and you know, th th there's a lot of smartphones coming up with um, with good um, uh, version of WebKit, but um, you know, very underpowered. So yeah, it's a, it's a strange it's a strange time. So you've got like a Nokia C5 uh, that's an entry level phone. It's got uh, re a really bad uh, processor and RAM, but it will have have a really good version of WebKit on it, so it will render the page really well. And then you can compare that to uh, an iPhone 5 that has Opera Mini in it. So the capabilities would be less, or you would at least get a static version of the site. It's a very bizarre issue to try and to try and solve. Sure. I don't think there is a magic bullet. Actually, in the modernizer web page, in the documentation, say it's because you can use polyfill doesn't mean you should. I think mm. I said that in the site. It's true. Yeah, so it's really. <laughs> So that's really developer have to developers have to decide what you want to really support. You know, and many times like a fancy UI would be really nice, but do you really care? And some browsers have been like around corners. Really, you don't always need this. You know, you can always drop certain, especially if it's just UI prettiness, you can drop it. But I guess the other part of this is that there are some features. There's a set of features that you cannot uh, let degrade gracefully. Uh, WebGL. Get user, get user media, uh, web audio API. Uh, these many can't be polyfilled. Hmm. Um, and so, what is the responsible way in, in defining a, a browser support policy when you're dealing with features of this sort, where you're providing an experience that um, competes with something on a native platform uh, and it's not content based? So, so you mentioned WebGL. I can give you an example there. Uh, uh, on, on the BBC News, we do. Uh, we've started doing WebGL content now. We've uh, got the Mars. We had the Mars Lander 3D uh, object. So if you had WebGL supported, you could spin it round and, and zoom in and stuff like that, and it was really nice. But then uh, there's no polyfill in that. So what other browsers would get is an image is an image gallery of the 3D model. So we wouldn't try to polyfill the content. We'd offer altern an alternative content. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, John Rezig, if you could, would love. Thank you. So I took this question because I didn't like it, so I didn't want it to be asked. <laughs> the question was roughly that they felt that you could get away with supporting uh, uh, browsers that did not have JavaScript. And I feel that that is not the case that for most content websites, you need to support uh, clients that do not have JavaScript. But to spin it into a more legitimate question, what about 
web applications where you're not dealing with strictly content-based. I feel like most of you are dealing with content where it's like, here's a news article, here's some information you want to read. Obviously, in that case, there shouldn't be a barrier in between you and reading that. So, but like, what about a, a whole application that is built and very JavaScript centric? Should you be making a fallback for that? Like, I know if you want to use Gmail and there's no JavaScript, you fall back to this form based thing. And I have no idea how well that's maintained, but that's got to be someone's sad job. And like, so like, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, but, but I mean, like, I assume not everyone wants to be doing like old like you know HTML tables and like doing the forms and like so like is that a legitimate thing? Should people be worrying about that for their applications? Uh, Tom, uh, I'd say it's always best to create an experience that doesn't just immediately fail when something goes wrong with with the JavaScript. So I think Gmail is a great example that you point out. So it's something that is a service; it is purely functionality. Uh, but then uh, I, th I think we should just make experiences. There's a great, uh, I'll, in fact, I'll let you say this. So, you, so, so I read on the GDS website about the about why you should make progressive enhancement with JavaScript. Do you get what I'm talking about? Uh, no? Okay. So Ed said <laughs> that uh, instead of instead of uh, build your applications like an escalator instead of a lift. Do you get me now? Was that you that said that? I don't. I don't think I wrote that. Was it Jake? Uh, I remember I read reading. It, I read it on the GDS elevator. Site. So somebody said, uh, <laughs> you mean, if, an es if, "If an escalator breaks, the worst thing that's going to happen is it's going to turn into uh, a uh, stairs. some stairs, so you can keep walking Much up. So you can keep walking up it. But then if, <laughs> but then if you're in a lift and it breaks, then you're stuck in the fucking lift. You know, there's nothing. <laughs> uh, there's nothing you can do. And it's the same with JavaScript applications. But there's, right? Well, I guess there's a certain class. There's plenty of JavaScript applications, a diagramming tool, an mm -hmm. IAM client, like. Many of these rely on real-time data, um, cannot be done with page refreshes. Um, and so some of these do require JavaScript for their interactions. Jake wrote a really good blog post on this recently. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, Jake, would you like to comment on how? <laughs> <laughs> for those who couldn't see, Jake You're was waving to. quite madly. I'm kind of perching on the stairs because I was actually on the way to the bathroom. So you caught me just at the right point. Um, <laughs> Uh, any website that has a loading bar is, is a missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity to serve the content directly uh, without JavaScript and, and then get JavaScript in there to do it. And Gmail is an example of that. I mean, it has. Um, I mean, Gmail should have URLs. I should be able to bookmark like a page to a, a particular email, and when I hit that, I should get that content on the page, and then JavaScript can come in and add the rest. I mean, it is. It is just a series of tabs and forms. It, it doesn't need to depend on JavaScript for first render. But the but the Gmail the Gmail web app also also has URLs that are permalinkable for all messages as well. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, just to repeat, um, which matches this use case is um, you have JavaScript applications heavily reliant on JavaScript, but um, you also have these you know these phones which are coming up, which will have browsers which support JavaScript, but these are underpowered phones in which it will be actually better for them to to get a version without JavaScript than to get a version with JavaScript, but which runs really, really slowly. So um, in those cases, it might be better for them to to get a lighter version of the page. Um, so and the other thing is, um, you know, search engines. Once again, if you have like single page applications, you know, you can run Node and Phantom JS and you know uh, use to use a solution with that, but. I still think that it would be better to just have something which can can be run without JavaScript. Yeah, I suppose Sorry, it. I suppose in that the search engine optimization, um, it's a balance of what's what's easy for you, but it's certainly if you're if it's important to, for you to have that content available to search, uh, you need to find a way to do that either through progressive enhancement or through a complex server-side rendering farm. The the alternative. The other side of the argument is that uh, making a job, making an application that purely relies on JavaScript is probably a lot faster. So uh, I, uh, I, so I would say, you mean if times and you mean if, if you're trying to get something up and running fast, if you're prototyping, if you got uh, if if you got deadline issues, then you mean that's that is that is an option. You can do that. However, I would always try to make. Uh, something a progressive enhancement. So in, in the slide where I spoke about 
the things that were nice, so accessibility, SEO, uh, working without JavaScript, usability, all of those things are idealisms. But and on their own, they're probably not great arguments that you can go to your uh, manager and say, hey, this doesn't work with, uh, with screen readers, because your boss will probably turn around and say, I don't care about screen readers. But when you add them all together, uh, they create something bigger, and that's that's like that's the whole point of the web, right? And all of those things, if you develop with all of those things in mind, then you're kind of developing in and in, in the current of the of the web. You're 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 swimming with the web as opposed to swimming against it, which is what I think is like applications that are purely JavaScript are swimming against a little bit. So. So you can make things that are purely JavaScript, but I think it's it's better, and you get added benefits by building things in a sure. progressive and hand. Uh, Matt, may I see you have a comment? Uh, we're gonna have to make this very quick, but uh, I want to get your voice here. Sorry, somebody says accessibility, and I go crazy. Um, I, I just wanted to say, like, to, to add on to this, and I think BBC is a great example of this that. The users of, of, of assistive technology are not like legacy or down level users either. Like, if you have something like data visualization or chat or anything I interactive, those are still things that you need to make accessible, whether or not you're going to serve them to, to legacy clients. Like, everybody is expecting that. They have the latest assistive technologies, they have the latest browsers like everybody else. And, you know, it's important to decouple them from like, well, we'll just serve them the text only site because that's the same thin girl they've had since the 90s. Yep, 98.4% uh, of screen reader users have JavaScript enabled uh, from the recent WebAIM survey. Uh, but guys, uh, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much to our panelists uh, for joining us up here, and thank you guys. <laughs>